Okay, so we have further two papers in this uh, in this session, in this in this day actually. Um, so it's twenty five minutes for presenters and ten minutes for for discussions. Uh, so we start with Valerio, yes. uh, and uh, is uh, the paper is called "Risk to Buffer Setting a Single and Structural Capital Buffers Through Bank Stress Test." So, seems super relevant for the discussion we just had uh, in the first part. So thanks a lot. Uh, to to move the slide, I is there oh, okay. Thanks. So thanks a lot for giving us the possibility to present this paper. This is a joint paper with uh, Cyril Quallier, that is also at the European Central Bank. What we do in this paper is uh, to propose an approach that we call risk to buffer to jointly set uh, cyclical and structural buffer through bank stress test. Basel three introduced the distinction between two types of buffers. So we have cyclical buffers on one, the one hand, and on the other hand, we have structural buffers. So the cyclical buffers are the buffers that vary with the financial cycle. So let's say with indebtedness and other factors of the financial cycle. One example of that is, for example, the counter cyclical buffer. Other buffers, instead, they, they, they remain constant across the financial cycle, so the structural buffer, and they cover different types of banks' vulnerability. Importantly, they are also set at a lower frequency. So we can think, for example, of the capital conservation buffer, the GC buffer, or the P2G buffer. And also, for example, uh, one, one example could be also the, the non-cyclical component of the counter cyclical buffer. Uh, a key important caveat here is that the structural buffers, like, for example, the capital conservation buffer and the P2G, can ensure resilience against economic downturns, but are not quarterly set to counter financial, financial risks. So, for example, if financial cycle conditions evolve, these are not going to be the buffer that are going to move, that are going to move, but we are going to also only see a movement in the calibration of the counter cyclical buffer. In prudential policy, buffers are often calibrated with stress test model. So we have macroeconomic models that are generated and used in bank stress test models to obtain capital shortfalls. Based on these capital shortfalls, we are going to calibrate the capital buffers. So this raises a couple of questions. So first of all, starting from this shortfall, how can we disentangle cyclical and structural buffers? So which part of the shortfall is going to be devoted to the cyclical component of these buffers and which part is going to be instead devoted to the structural. And also, another point is, when we're running this stress test, how does the evolution of the financial cycle can affect the calibration of the cyclical buffer? So we're going to see variation in the cyclical component, in the cyclical risks. How are we going to map this into our stress test framework? And um, also, the, 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 the clarification about this issue is not just philosophical, because it also matters, for example, to avoid the risk of overlap between cyclical and structural buffers. So this, for example, could bring to an inefficient and not transparent use of the uh, capital framework. What we do in this project is to provide a conceptual framework to think and to calibrate cyclical and structural buffers. We call this risk to buffer. So the idea is that we're going to map each risk to a buffer each risk level to a buffer. And uh, it is based on the integration of a nonlinear macroeconomic model, the cyclical amplifier. We call it like this, and we're going to see how and why. And uh, uh, we are going to link it to, uh, we are going to integrate it to a bank stress test model. So in the first step, we generate uh, uh, state-dependent uh, uh, scenarios. So the macro model provides these scenarios whose severity depend on the level of cyclical risks. And the idea is that the higher the risk, the higher the severity of the scenario. And multiple scenarios are generated by using the same set of shocks, but for different risk levels. So I have a set of shocks, let's say housing and uh, credit shocks that hit the economy, and the propagation of the shock is going to vary with respect to the risk level. And the higher the risk overall, the higher is going to be the amplification of the shock in the economy. So producing a more severe scenario in case of higher risk. Then what we have to do is uh, a policy decision, which is we need to fix uh, a, a reference level. So we have to fix a level of cigarette risk that we consider as the reference risk, a sort of medium run, a sort of reference risk for which we can say the losses that we are going to obtain under this risk are going to be covered by the structural buffer. 
and the additional losses that were going to instead generated by the amplification of the cyclical risks in the model, these are going to be associated to the cyclical buffer. Let me just show this with, uh, with an illustration. So we have on the left hand side the evolution of the capital losses in our stress test model. So let's think that we had our macroeconomic scenario with different risk level, different uh, severity. So again, the higher the risk, the higher the severity of the scenario, obtained always using the same set of shocks. It is going to be our nonlinear model that is going to deliver this different severity. Then we use this severity in a stress test model and we obtain different capital losses. So the capital losses, for example, under the minimum risk are going to be in the, like the blue line, so smaller. And then the higher risk, for example, the median risk is going to be uh, is going to present higher losses. And let us assume that the current risk is higher than the median risk. Then we are going to have a, lo a larger losses under the current risk scenario. So if, for example, we fix here, the risk to buffer for works in this way. So we fix a reference level with respect to an historical risk. So we say, let's say that the median risk is our reference level. So the losses, so like the yellow losses, that we're going to obtain under the median risk are going to be covered by the structural buffer. The additional losses, let's say that we are in the current risk in the red case, these additional losses are going to be covered by the cyclical buffer. If, for example, the current loss, uh, losses, the current risk decreases over time, then the severity of the scenario when we're going to simulate also is going to decrease. So that means that uh, our new losses are going to be in uh, uh, between the red and the yellow line. So that means that the cyclical component of the buffer is going to be reduced and is going to be moving with respect to the evolution of the risk. Another option that we present here is also considering uh, uh, another case where the reference risk is not the median risk, but it's the minimum risk. In this case, the structural buffer is going to be covering just the losses under the blue line, so under the minimum risk, and the cyclical component is going to be the additional losses that we're going to obtain under the, let's say, the current risk. So this red bar and the right hand side. Let me frame a bit the paper into the literature. So we have uh, three streams of literature that we focus in on. So the first stream of literature uses stress test model to calibrate capital buffers. Then we have, uh, so with respect to this literature, what we do is that we try to find a way through which we can use these approaches, but also understanding which part of the buffer is going to be cyclical and which part is going to be structural. And uh, then we have the nonlinear macroeconomic models. So for example, there are also the contribution uh, by David in, in, uh, in this type of literature. So this model, they find that the propagation of the economic shocks changes according to uh, the state of the economy. So let's say recession or uh, normal times. Here we focus on the dimension of the cyclical risk dimension and we find that the the cyclical risk dimension can affect the propagation of this shock. So we really try to highlight the connection between cyclical risks and uh, the propagation of the shocks. And then we use this type of uh, uh, this, uh, the outcome from this nonlinear macroeconomic model in the generation of the macroeconomic scenario. And then we have the third stream of literature that instead look more at growth at risk, so tries to link the relation between, uh, try to find the relation between risk and growth. And uh, so our model also is able to do that, and we do that in a multivariate framework that I'm going to show you in a, in a second. So uh, why do we call them this macroeconomic model the cyclical amplifier? We call it like this because the financial cycle amplifies the propagation of shocks, not of all the shocks, but overall, it has a role of amplification of the shocks. And uh, in this case, we're going to focus on the debt service ratio as the main state variable. So in this paper, we focus on the debt service ratio as the variable that is going to provide information on the evolution of level of risks, but we also internally developing also other uh, specification where, for example, uh, we use the systemic risk indicator that is an indicator that we use internally to uh, assess the evolution of, uh, of cyclical risks. And also we see uh, the role of this type of cyclical risks in the amplification of the shocks. Uh, the model is a multivariate smooth transition regime switching model estimated on a euro area. So we, what we do is we estimate this model and then we identify the set of, macro, the set of macroeconomic shocks. Here I'm going to focus more on the housing shock and the spread shock, but also one could also consider other types of shocks. And also for the uh, implementation of the risk to buffer, 
the use of this uh, structural identification is not a necessary condition. It is more there to help us to understand the bit of propagation and to give also a structural interpretation as much as possible to what we find in uh, the, linear, the linear effect that we find. And uh, we have the state effect. So this, uh, uh, that means that the model is able to uh, deliver uh, non-linearity. The propagation of the economic shocks is going to depend on the level of the cyclical risk. So in this case, by the level of the debt service ratio of uh, the non-financial private sector in the euro area. So the model is uh, um, estimated with local projection, and it is somehow at the crossroad between the Jorda original contribution, where we have uh, a, like a multivariate model, like a VAR estimated, whose coefficients are estimated with local projection, so, so for different time horizon, and uh, uh, the contribution by the rare earth weights, where instead we have a non-linear structure, so that is uh, like the one that we have in equation one, where we assume that the economy smoothly transition from one state to another. So it's transition from the upper state to the low state of the economy. And ZT is going to be our state variable, so the debt service ratio, was going to make us transition from one state to the another. So that means that this ZT moves over time. And that means also that we're going to transition smoothly across one state to the other. So that means that we can also have the different risk levels. So it's not just a threshold, say high risk, low risk, but it means that I'm going to have a DSR of a certain level, and this is going to be associated to a certain type of amplification. I can increase the debt service ratio in the model of uh, a percentile, and I'm going to obtain a different impulse responses. Um, the coefficient BHU and BHD are going to be the coefficient used uh, to uh, propagate the, pro the to, to, op to obtain the impulse responses uh, from the propagation of the shocks. So the shocks arrive in time t, and they're going to propagate, they're going to hit the different uh, variables uh, that I have in my vector of endogenous variables, and uh, uh, that is with this yt, and this is going to be propagated over time through, the co through this matrix coefficient bhu and bhd. The FZT is this state variable, is this uh, transition variable actually, that tra makes us transitioning from the high to the low regime and vice versa. And it is a logistic transformation of the original uh, state variable, so the original debt service ratio. So it is just a way to obtain a transformation from uh, in a new way, so to have a variable that goes from zero to one. And then we construct confidence interval using uh, uh, the bootstrap approach. The impact matrix is uh, computed uh, from the variance-covariance matrix uh, of residual at horizon one. So I do the estimation for the different horizon, but I focus uh, for the, to, in order to obtain the shock on the horizon one. So like in a VAR, I'm going to obtain my variance-covariance uh, uh, matrix. I'm going to do, in this case, a Cholesky decomposition, and uh, I'm going to project over time this uh, vector, this impact matrix that I obtained. So for the different shocks, I have uh, an effect on uh, the different variable. And uh, the coefficient VHD and VHU are going to make me propagate the shock over time for the different variable. The variable FZ there is going to decide which of the two world dominates, so the up world or the D world. So that means that uh, uh, the, the impulse responses are going to be convex combination of these two extreme states of the world. So the high vulnerability case and the low vulnerability case. Here in the paper, what we report is uh, uh, the, 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 when the, the logistic transformation is at the 15th percentile or 85th percentile. The endogenous variable are the usual suspects of this type of literature. So we have in this, in this paper real GDP, inflation, unemployment rate, policy rate, real house prices, and the spread between sovereign 10 years bond rate and risk-free rate. We chose this variable because they were also the variables that were the mo among the most important variables that are provided in the DBA stress test scenario. So we wanted a bit also to have this type of, uh, uh, of approach to also to, uh, to think a bit about uh, also in these terms. Uh, but of course, this type of uh, specification can also evolve according to, uh, to the different type of, of demand that we have. Um, the cyclical risk that we use is the debt service ratio of non-financial private sector. The sample is, uh, uh, goes from 1999 to 2018. And uh, uh, here I'm going to report the estimates for the euro area, but there are also the estimates for country level. The interesting fact of the country level estimation is that they are also going to provide as an indication in the euro area where the nonlinearity comes from. So let's say they have a propagation, a strong nonlinear propagation on uh, 
uh, the housing shock. If I go and look at the euro area countries, also I can spot and I can detect where the type of this type of nonlinear amplification are going to be are going to be larger. Uh, the state variable, as we said, is this that service ratio, so which is computed uh, as the ratio between an annuity uh, that I pay of my debt D uh, with uh, maturity M and effective lending rate YT. And so I'm going to compute how much I have to, re to, to use to repay back on my, to, uh, how much I have to pay spend each year to pay back my debt with respect to the income. So it's really uh, this debt service ratio of the whole economy that is going to tell me how the agents uh, uh, are going to be vulnerable. So the debt service ratio has this nice feature also that is related to three key factors of uh, financial vulnerability, that is the debt that I have, my capacity to repay. So if, for example, I have a negative shock on YT, I'm going to have uh, higher vulnerability, and also the effective lending rate, which is also, uh, as we see nowadays, also a key variable uh, that can affect the evolution of this variable. Let's give a look at the results. So here we have the result for the housing shock. So here it is, again, it's the same house price shock. So it's a house price shock that arrived in period one, and then the period after is going to be propagated so it arrives on house prices, and then the, the period after is going to be propagated on the other macro and financial variable. So we interpret this shock as a, a shock to preference. So the agents want to buy more housing. So this is pretty standard in literature. And what we see is that uh, we're going to report here the, um, the propagation under high vulnerability and low vulnerability. And uh, under high vulnerability, so the red case, the red line, so when we have high risk in the economy, the same shock is going to be transmitted more to the economy and it's going to have stronger effect on output, unemployment and policy rate. Whereas instead, when we are in low vulnerability, the same shock is going to be instead much less significant and less strong, especially in the first two years after the beginning of the shock. I also report here the spread shock. So this is uh, an exogenous increase in spread that also uh, arrives uh, at house prices in the same period. It transmits, so you have uh, in the same period an increase in spread and a decrease in house prices, and then the shock is propagated to the rest of the economy in the, in the following period. Uh, and uh, this type of shock here triggers a stronger decrease in output under the case of high risk. Also here, under high risk, we're going to have a stronger recession. The green line instead is the case of low vulnerability. In that case, the shock is going to be less amplified. This type of effect, this type of nonlinear effect, are also found, for example, in another paper that we have more on the US. What we can see also considering the different economies is that the nonlinearity on the housing shock is pretty constant across the different type of estimation, whereas instead for the spread shock, it also can depend a bit on the economy that we are considering. Uh, then in the, the second part of the paper, we try to apply this methodology and to make it a bit more concrete. And uh, we use uh, a very simple and fictional stress test model. So we take uh, the EBA stress test result of 2017, so something really from, uh, from the, the, the stress test exercise, and we try to link the evolution of the CT1 ratio with respect to the macroeconomic variable. We try different types of specification. In the end, we just wanted to have something very simple, something to make just the point. So in the end, we chose, we, we went for this very simple equation where we regress the CT1 ratio on the GDP, and we find that a decrease in 1% of GDP triggers a decrease of 1% in CT1 ratio on average. So this was also interestingly a, a result that, we, that was also in line with other stress test models that we were running internally in Bande de France. So that's also why we like this type of, uh, of number. So of course, it's, it's not a number that I would take seriously, but it's really, it's more to give an illustration and to provide a, an elasticity between GDP and CT1 ratio. Um, the cyclical amplifier, so here it's, it's used to generate multiple scenario with the same set of shocks and uh, with different uh, risk levels. And then we use our stress test equation to obtain uh, the, the bank losses for each risk level. And once we define a risk uh, reference risk, we can calibrate both the, the structural component and the cyclical component. So here, for example, we created a different scenario by considering two very strong recessionary housing shock, so a four standard deviation housing shock and four standard deviation spread shock. 
that hit the economy at different risk levels. So in the blue line, we have the case of low risk. And in the red line, we have the case of high risk. The yellow risk is the medium risk. So as you can see, the same shock trigger a recession that after two years arrive at 2% in case of low risk. And the same re recession instead triggers, a, a, the, a, the, same, the same shocks trigger a recession that is three times larger when there is high risk in the economy. And the intermediate case instead are found for the case of medium risk, yellow line, and the cyclical risk that here we assume, of course, it's an assumption being at the 75th percentile. So if we use this type of, uh, of uh, machine, also this type of, uh, of macroeconomic variables, and we link it to the stress equation that we've seen before, this famous 0 0.45, we're going to obtain the different shortfalls for the different risk levels. And here, from the risk levels, then we can try to map and obtain rounded levels of buffers. So that's why then we have that, essentially, let us assume that uh, we want to cover with the minimum risk uh, the, uh, the, 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 the median risk is going to be our reference risk. So that means that we're going to take the losses under the fifth percentile, so the yellow losses, to calibrate the structural component of the buffer. So this is going to be the buffer who are going to remain constant across the financial cycle. And uh, let us consider that uh, the, the, the risk is at uh, uh, the highest level to the max risk. Then the additional losses are going to be instead used to calibrate the cyclical component of the buffer. So if, for example, the, 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 the risk level then decreases from 100 to 75, we are also going to decrease the cyclical component of the buffer, which is going to be just equal to the uh, light red uh, brick, so without the dark, uh, the dark red brick. Uh, so on, on that also, I think one, one point uh, that uh, I also wanted to mention referring also to, to, to David's discussion, is that, uh, so if we look at the different CC, uh, the, sorry, the, the different capital stack, and according to the different risk level, this type of results seem to suggest that the biggest part of the, of the space should be cyclical, in that the larger part of, uh, um, of the losses arrive when there is a higher uh, risk, cyclical risk in the economy. So in this case, uh, uh, if, for example, the, the minimum risk would be just, uh, let's say, the 50th percentile, then the, 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 risk, the reference risk would be this, this low risk, then a big part portion of the model of this, of, this, of this stack would be cyclical. So this also goes a bit in the direction uh, than the point that was made before. Another point that was also touched in the discussion before was the interaction between capital buffer and borrower-based measures. So uh, what we also claim here is that uh, this type of, uh, of approach can also help us to think about this type of interaction. So the, the macroeconomic model that we're focusing on is a macroeconomic model that, uh, has, uh, uh, the, um, that looks more at, uh, at the debt service ratio of non-financial private sector. So we're also looking a lot at this type of amplification that derives on the borrower side. So let us assume that uh, the borrower's best measures are able to re reduce the debt service ratio. So then we have also a link with uh, the between borrower based measures and the capital measure. So here I do an extreme, we do an extreme assum assumption of uh, borrower based measures able to limit the debt service ratio from 100 to 75th percentile. Of course, in reality, this is, much, uh, is a much smaller effect uh, so far. Um, and so in this case, the current risk would decrease no? from 100 to uh, 75th percentile. So that means that when, thanks to the action of the borrower-based measures, I can also assess what is the effect on the reduction of the cyclical risk. And in this case, so the less CV scenario would imply a cyclical buffer two percentage points smaller. Again, the magnitudes are, of course, uh, um, not realistic, but it's really just uh, take it as an illustration. So that means that in this way, we can measure how to link, we can measure a link between borrower-based measures and capital, and capital ratios. So to conclude, we provide a criterion to jointly calibrate cyclical and structural buffer. We do that by integrating a nonlinear macroeconomic model to the stress test. And uh, the, the key feature is to have a macroeconomic model in which uh, the higher the risk, the higher the severity of the scenario. And then we, we can use this also framework to calibrate uh, uh, serial and capital bu structural buffers, but also, again, as, we, as I just showed, uh, we can also uh, think of uh, the relation between borrower-based measures and the capital measures, provided that we can assess the effect from borrower-based measure to that service ratio. And also, these risk to buffer can also be 
flexible and adapt, and adapt to different type of uh, um, of, uh, of uh, questions, like for example, the sectoral buffer. So in case we use the model to simulate more a certain type of risks uh, that uh, are covered by the sectoral buffer, or also for the positive neutral buffer, in case we want to adapt our um, partitioning of the of the of the caliber of the macro potential space just to the CCYB experience. No, and then we would have. Uh, uh, this type of uh, also the, the nonlinear macroeconomy model would help us uh, to do this type of, of uh, partitioning. So thanks a lot. That's all on my side. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Valerio, for the presentation. Very much on time as well. Very appreciated too. Um, so I think Marco, but not Marco Luca, but another Marco it should be online to discuss. Yes. Ah, super. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see my screen. We, we hear you and, and, and see. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Just organize the screen a bit. Alrighty. Um, so first of all, just a quick thanks to the organizers for allowing me to, to discuss this very nice paper. Um, by Cyril and Valerio. Um, so my name is Marco Gross. I'm working at the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the IMF. Um, okay, and on this first slide, I'm just briefly summarizing what the authors do. I think I can almost actually skip this because it was very nicely explained uh, just a moment ago by Valerio what, what this is about, right? So like real quick, real brief, this is about the idea to um, to combine a nonlinear macro financial model with a stress test model machinery to uh, to inform cyclical and structural bank capital buffer requirements. Right. So we, we've just seen this figure fig, figure one uh, from the paper, uh, which has these different lines: blue, light orange, dark orange kind of corresponding to these uh, capital impacts resulting from, from different initial conditions, right? Initial uh, um, levels, different levels of cyclical vulnerability or risk, as, as the authors call it. Um, importantly, um, and that's a point that I will come back to in, in my comments in, in a moment, um, th there's this notion of structural risk and, and structural risk is defined as is defined by, by the authors as average cyclical risk or average cyclical vulnerability or alternatively some some lenient quantile of it so so at a level above it right so it basically means it's corresponding to to this light orange case this this light orange line or above it so somewhere between blue and orange light orange and so so that structural risk is and, and the impacts resulting from this uh, would be used to inform the structural buffer requirements right and then the cyclical scenarios come on top if this orange current risk that this dark orange line so happens to be uh, below light orange well then this would imply an additional cyclical buffer requirement and importantly and that's also a point i will come back to in a moment um, this capital ratio shift delta car that you know the shift in the capital ratio for the banking system um, from the structural scenario is suggested to, to be used as a backstop, right? So, so the overall buffer requirement would be uh, sort of not allowed to fall short of this level, of this backstop level. And so overall, I would just say this is, of course, uh, simply very useful work, timely and, and very relevant work. That's an upfront comment. So on the following two slides, I have two sort of conceptual slides up front before I come to, to the actual sort of comments and, and suggestions. So here on this slide, just to kind of recall the basic uh, rationale, the, the basic philosophy behind cyclical state dependent scenario design. It's basically something that Nelly was also talking about earlier. It's just like a visual representation of it that say if we so happen to be in an in initial boom phase and we conduct a stress test at this point and we ask what the buffer requirements should be 
then we should we, we would want to consider a delta a shift all the way down to the bottom of the cycle so this delta would be quite sizable but this is opposed to a case where on the right side here let's let's say we were in an initial recession or, or close to a, a recession at the bottom of the cycle well then this additional delta might be much it, it should be much smaller to, to arrive at the bottom uh, and in a way like the continuation of these bad conditions at the outset would be bad enough uh, for this cyclical scenario and so overall this is just to say that conceptually all of this this kind of schematic picture is pretty much in line with various frameworks that that are around like the stress capital buffer in the us the cyclical scenario exercise at the bank of england the also the ecb eba ssm sort of area-wide stress test exercises kind of i would say adhere to this principle even though there might still be uh, largely like linear models around but there were cases in the past uh, past exercises where some countries actually southern european countries say they so happen to be in this position on the right side of the chart and then in this case the shocks that were applied to them uh, were, were smaller you know they were they were made to be smaller to not overdo it so to speak and and to adhere to the cyclical uh, principle and then growth at risk obviously is is a direct nonlinear framework in line with this principle and even just to recall the, the sort of very simple methodology that we sometimes also employ at the site, like a two standard deviation benchmark from historical mean kind of benchmark at the site. Even this, if, if, we, if we define it as a deviation from historical mean, which is the horizontal line in this picture, actually does also result in state dependent scenarios. And then obviously the, the author's work is exactly in line with this this whole series of examples as well and in line with this philosophy so i'm just having one more slide and then i get to the uh, to the comments um to, just to complete this discussion and to have an additional perspective on the on some say external shock scenarios exogenous external shock scenarios which can also happen um, so these can be external demand shocks for exporting countries supply shocks for import dependent countries there's FX shock and capital flow considerations here. And the main point, I would say the main takeaway is just the main point I want to make is that um, in such a case, you know, these external shocks can happen. They do happen independent, independently of the cyclical position of a country, right? So these shocks in a way don't care about the cyclical position of a country. But of course, these external shocks can also be uh, triggering the cyclical downturns. And that's also a point I may come back to later on. So with this, th this kind of background in the back of our minds, I would come to my uh, sort of comments and suggestions to the paper. Uh, I have six of them, six comments. Um, on this first slide, the first point is all around the uh, same notion of releasable buffers and, and the positive neutral CCYB. Again, first, just to quickly recall that in the paper, uh, Cyril and Valeria, Valerio define um, structural risk as the average of cyclical risk or some lenient quantile above it, corresponding to times of low vulnerability. Um, and so here is basically a related question then. At, at one point in the paper, actually, the authors point to this question. They ask it themselves, like how to strike the balance between this so defined structural risk and cyclical risk so at what level basically to set the quantile say for for this structural scenario and the, the implied structural buffers and related to this in turn again is this notion of the backstop and the question is is this backstop meant to be a structural buffer such as the the ccob the capital conservation buffer that's not releasable and whose use would imply restrictions. So, so my reading from the paper is that this might be actually what the authors may have in mind, also from the presentation. And if so, then I think the sort of problem would be still the one of say no or insufficient releasability of buffers during downturns. Okay, so that's my main point actually here. And so this brings me, this 
reasoning brings me to my, my first concrete suggestions, actually, uh, for the author's consideration, which is one that I think it could be useful to consider mapping the whole paper more directly and more explicitly into the positive neutral CCYB discussion. So currently, this is just like one sentence and a footnote in the middle of the paper. So I think it could be useful really to expand on this, especially when defining structural risk as average cyclical risk, as, as the authors do. And then in turn, related to this in the same context, it would be useful to, to further elaborate on, on this notion of the backstop. So do the authors mean structural buffers of the CCOB kind? Um, you know, and then again, a, a discussion around the releasability of these buffers would be very much like useful and warranted, I would say. And again, the overall message here would be, I would find it quite useful to, to link it really to the positive neutral CCYB more explicitly. So then come five additional comments. I will keep them pretty short. They are on the next two slides. So the first, the second point here is sort of a model oriented point, tech point um, about the say possible state dependence for bank balance sheets uh, when and their response when computing the neutral cyclical average scenario impacts specifically. So, so what I mean here is that when, when employing a stress test model suite to obtain these, you know, shifts in capital ratios of the banks from the cyclical average position, position, you know, the middle of the cycle, then I think it would be useful to consider taking recent historical averages of, of all the various risk metrics for the banks as a T0 anchor, so to speak. So this would mean default rates interest rates at the bank level, capital ratio, so essentially the whole balance sheet and, and sort of uh, profit and loss statement. And and why in turn? Well, because I think there might be some additional, so some non-linearities which may otherwise distort these estimates of, of the shift in capital ratios from other cyclical starting points, okay? So it's, it's a bit of a, of a model-oriented detailed point, but I was just curious and I, I would find it useful if this could be discussed maybe a bit in the paper. A second point, a lighter one maybe, is about the idea to, to mention some alternative nonlinear models. So in the paper, as we saw, the, the authors use this smooth transition regime switching model, which is pretty fine. I think it's quite a good choice, actually. I have no particular concerns or so. Um, but it's sort of interesting to see that the authors had that they had to use these sort of sizable shocks for standard deviation shocks to spreads and house prices. Would just be useful to to make it a bit more generic to discussion and say some alternative uh, models can come into play, like endogenous Markov regime switching models, for instance. Um, and I think the reason why why it might be useful to to do this kind of discussion a bit is also to to hint to the fact that such other methods might be more amenable to reflect a cyclical downturn narrative. So what I mean is that um, it might actually need small perturbations, small shocks, not forced standard deviation shocks, you know, but small shocks that cause large downturns at the cyclical peak. As a quick hint to a, to a kind of theory-oriented paper that's making this point and showing it in a model, and which is also kind of a theory perspective to growth at risk, in fact. One more point. Um, in relation to borrower-based policies, so, so the authors speak a little bit in the paper to this interplay between borrower-based and capital-based macroprudential policies. Um, I should say here that maybe the reason, why, well, let me first read it out and I make a caveat here. So the first point here is to say the authors suggest that borrower-based policies can help reduce current cyclical risk. When I was reading this, I was thinking, well, may they not also reduce average cyclical risk beyond the short term? So it's what the authors, again, define as structural risk as per their definition. And maybe it's a bit of a function of the fact that in, in the version of the paper that I saw, at least, I thought it was not the debt service ratio, so kind of a, a flow-flow ratio that um, Valerio was, was now talking about in the slides, but in the paper I thought it was actually a... Um, a debt to GDP ratio, so kind of a stock to flow ratio. And that you know, it doesn't ch change my point or affect this point like very fundamentally. But anyways, so my point is uh, this discussion could be maybe extended a little bit and, and be refined essentially. Uh, two final quick points. 
in the interest of time, I will not read this out. I guess this is just to say more references to the literature could be established. Um, there's a very useful survey paper by uh, David and Corthas, a recent IMF working paper on scenario design. Let me just mention this. Uh, we had a book chapter in the in the in the um, stress test handbook that was published last year with many many chapters. We have one where we do hint to this idea to use non-linear models indeed and and you know account for state dependency and so forth. Um, then there's a whole bunch of papers. I'm sure the authors are actually aware of these papers. It's just not in the draft yet about the effects of capital buffer releases in general and especially following the COVID pandemic. And then the last two bullet points are about the uh, positive cycle neutral CCYB, the, you know, the relevant BIS papers would, would be useful to cite and refer to and discuss. A final point, very short. I think it would be useful to actually consider shortening the paper. It's a bit long. I think the content, you know, it's, it's pretty clear what it is. It's pretty useful uh, and would just benefit from, from being, you know, cast into you know, less pages, less words. Less, I think it could fit into less than 15 pages. Say. So all the references I had are here and that's it. Thanks very much. Let me pause here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Marco, for also taking the time from, from well, I guess it's Washington. Um, so um, let me open the floor. Yeah, we have probably five minutes for mm -hmm. questions. You know, David first. What? Ireland? Um, yeah. Okay, so let's go in counterclockwise. So we start here. Thanks. Great, great presentation. Lovely discussion as well. Um, I just wanted to offer a thought on how to think about the cycle neutral structural bit. To my mind, that must link to the costs of raising bank capital requirements. So if you thought those costs were very low, you'd probably want to run the regime with very high structural buffers, where if it's high, you do the converse. So I was wondering if you could think about incorporating that, and then that would give you a tied up view about the whole thing. Yeah, my question sort of relates to that a little bit. Um, my comment is that the debt service ratio is a variable that uh, can move around, uh, certainly as we are observing now as a, as a function of what interest rates are doing. Um, so the question is, this framework, wouldn't it be more useful to, rather than looking at the current debt service ratio, to sort of project that forward and uh, consider what would happen to these risks if the debt service ratio were to shoot up as a result of increases in interest rates. Um, but then uh, the question arises uh, that David just asked, you know, to what extent should we prepare, prepare for those uh, high readings of the DSR, perhaps even ex ante, and, and what's the right balance and where does that, how does that, uh, how should we think about that? I guess this question also relates to the to the question of what, why this you know whether the Z variable should be endogenous or you know what drives the, the change you know and uh, which also I think Marco mentioned. Uh, yeah, would you have a question as well? Please. So, is there a microphone over here? Thanks, Jan Yurtanova, Danish Central Bank. I was just wondering from a more practical perspective, uh, you do mo your model on the data uh, going from 1990, uh, 99 uh, to 2018, and the question we often face uh, doing macroprudential policies, to what degree the results are dependent on the historical relationships between the different variables, and what happens to the results uh, when we see like a swift shift in the environment as we've currently experienced. Uh, can we still use the results or do we need to make some adjustments uh, because uh, definitely the loss ratios that we've experienced during the financial crisis do not reflect on the environment of high interest rates that we're facing now. Uh, and another question regarding the borrower-based measures. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to see this interaction between the borrower-based measures and the capital-based measures. Um, but I was just wondering whether the conclusions of the borrower-based measures take into account the fact that it takes quite a lot of time before the borrower-based measures uh, take effect on the stock of the loans. Yes, thanks. Yeah, one question here, please. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much. I don't really have any questions. I have a few small suggestions. So ESR, I think it's a very interesting measure to use uh, for your purposes, but sometimes in some cases we know that vulnerabilities can be in disguise of small uh, DSR ratios. For example, uh, DSR ratio of a nation may be small, but a change, a drastic change in DSR ratio could really present vulnerabilities to a financial system. So you could consider that. And another suggestion is kind of address uh, other issues raised by uh, by the discussant, including uh, the structural uh, risks and 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 uh, positive neutral CCYB, is perhaps use a a, vari a variety of different indicators. For example, the output gap could be interesting measure to complement uh, the DSR and perhaps the house price gap. If you want to talk, especially about the structural features of a country or vulnerabilities within the housing market. So that would be interesting to see. Thank you. Okay, I think we need to stop here. You know, I, I would like to ask you to be <laughs> concise. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, thanks a lot. I am really surprised by how much both the, the discussion and the question are really on point uh, on, uh, on many things that we were also internally starting to to, to, to work on and to improve. So thanks a lot, Marco, for the discussion. I think it's a, it's a very useful discussion. Also, you, 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 I really liked your initial uh, uh, rephrasing of the problem, but also in general, the, the, the point that you make. So uh, I will try a bit to, to, short, to be short indeed. Uh, so the absolutely point taken on the fact that the model, uh, this type of approach can, can well fit the positive neutral buffer. Uh, it is actually something that we we are considering and we are working on that. We are readapting a bit uh, the, the the framework also to consider uh, the differences uh, from uh, you know the, the the problem that we had there that was more the um, structural versus cyclical and uh, uh, but it's something that we you know we're trying to to evolve in that direction. So thanks a lot. Um, so the, just to give you a. a uh, also initial perspective so this this project was started more as you also mentioned uh, for uh, you know um, to, to think about the interaction between the EBA stress test result the P2G buffer and the counter seagull buffer so it was a period where the EBA, the EBA scenario there was this idea of uh, having higher risk for countries with uh, uh, with higher uh, higher severity for countries with higher risk in this type of exercise and uh, what we try to make in the paper is really this point that we need to understand what is the what, what we really mean by structural here. So uh, it's absolutely a, a good point. What I really like is also this uh, um, this mentioning of the of the relation of the nonlinear relation between the CT1 and uh, uh, the macro variable. So I, uh, yeah, completely on board with you that it's also a, a nonlinearity to to take into account, and also that's also something where where we're trying a bit also to to put. Uh, the nose. Um, thanks a lot for the suggestion on the other nonlinear models. Uh, it's uh, absolutely, I mean, we, we don't have to be you know, orthodox in, uh, in choosing one model, but you know, also other models can also help us to, to, to achieve uh, you know, this type of, uh, of severity and risk related severity. Uh, for, the, um, for the point, yes, on the borrower based measures, okay, I understand the point of trying to be a bit more. Uh, precise on what are the really the effects you know, in the channel with respect to to the to the so what is really structural also there so it's a, it's a dimension that we didn't we didn't think about yet uh, and also thanks uh, really for the, also for the for the practical suggestion uh, about you know shortening or you know this type of uh, of suggestion that are super useful feedbacks um, for passing to the to the other points. Um, and so the I, I, the point of David, no, that is that says uh, uh, the 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 cost uh, of raising buffer also could enter in this type of equation. This is also a very good point, you know, and also this bridges a bit uh, with the uh, with the positive neutral buffer discussion. Also, the idea that there is a part of the buffer that even if the risks are not high, since the cost of building the buffer is low, maybe we can converge to 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 that. So it's. Uh, uh, absolutely a good uh, a good dimension uh, also to to look at uh, i don't know how much we can incorporate in the model but it's uh, it's worth to look at uh, and also to to consider more this type of 
of of of, of channel, uh, both in uh, in terms of new variables or in terms of uh, state dependency. But uh, I agree overall that you know there is a bit of uh, you know the, the model focuses a lot on this type of amplification on the private sector. So maybe it could be useful since we are also talking of the of CT one buffers uh, to to also look a bit uh, more in that type of of direction. So it's uh, absolutely a good point. Um, for the use of that service ratio in the monetary policy, also in, in the general in the new environment, um, it is true that it's a, it's a, it's an nice exercise to think of, and uh, ideally, yeah, that could be also done with uh, with an endogenous uh, state variable. So this is not yet implemented, but that could be nice. Also, overall, I would say. Uh, per se, the exercise now of considering how the new environment increase the debt service ratio and what are the effects on the amplification also goes a bit in the in direction of interaction between monetary policy and the rest of the economy and the financial sector and ultimately also macro pro. So this is also something that uh, it's uh, it's absolutely a good point and uh, we could actually use it a bit in, uh, for example, in the agile teamwork that we're doing, where we, we try also to look a bit uh, in the in respect to this type of interaction. Um, so, okay, so the practical question, I think so it's a useful question, so <laughs> also to, 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 be, to be precise. So the, um, yeah, it's true that this, this is a nonlinear model we have with small samples. So it is true the results can, can a bit change according to the different type of, uh, of sample and also as, we, as I was saying before, also with respect to the country. Uh, what I find, what we find in general is that uh, overall there is an amplification of the shocks uh, when there is this higher risk in the economy. What can change is what type of shock are more amplified or less amplified. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, the housing shock probably is more amplified than other type of shock. Uh, monetary policy shock also is amplified uh, pretty often, but again, for some countries, this is not, not always the case. Not to mention that uh, including the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID period uh, completely um, creates you know, uh, completely different results, but this is you know, a non-linear model. I, I, I would be surprised uh, if the opposite uh, were true. Um, to okay, and then I wrap up. So okay, but happy to discuss more later. Thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. But, uh, really no, no, thanks, thanks. Sir. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, look at the next presentation. I understand is online. So Luis. So before we start, I forgot to say that uh, some one of you lost a room card from the Melia inside Frankfurt stand. So you cannot sleep here tonight. So if you if you don't have the card, uh, I guess you can ask. Uh, I don't know where, where it's, maybe it's, maybe it's outside in the in the in the uh, the desk. Anyway, if you don't find your room card, it's been found. Okay, so let's uh, let's proceed uh, with um, the next paper. So um, the others are from the Banco de España. Uh, you are connected. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you very well. Can you see my screen? Yeah, uh, well, no, not now. Okay, let me show it again. Can you be big? Okay. I hope it's there. Okay, so go ahead, 25 minutes. So we Thank you. forward your presentation. So first of all, let me apologize for not being able to attend in person, but uh, medical conditions really suggested to do this remotely. And today I'm going to be talking about the question whether macroprudential borrower-based measures should be targeting uh, non-financial corporations. This is joint work with my colleague Jorge Galán from Banco de España, but of course the usual disclaimer applies. This, these are our own views. It should not be taken to represent those of Banco de España or the Euro system. So the alarm of the talk is very straightforward. So let me just uh, jump into it. And so, of course, in this venue, it's almost, I don't need even to say this, but the role of non-financial private sector debt in previous crises has been by now well established. And this has motivated the introduction of broad macroprudential policies, such as the CCYD. But of course, risks might be concentrated in certain sectors, which has also motivated the introduction of targeted macroprudential policies and those very often have been focused on mortgage debt for good reasons since it played a very important role in the last 
in the last crisis. And the literature has already shown that there is a significant association between the deterioration in credit quality in mortgages and default. And by now, already a number of institutions or jurisdictions, excuse me, in particular in, in, in Europe, are already applying household focus macroprudential policies. However, uh, less attention has been paid to credit to non-financial corporations. And in this work, we explore whether targeted macroprudential policies focusing on, on non-financial corporations can also be effective in reducing the risk of future default of this type of, of loans in the same way that they are being used currently for, for households. And just to motivate this, uh, we see that Debt in Europe in the run-up to the previous crisis, the growth in household credit was actually faster, was actually stronger than, than growth for non-financial corporation credit. But since then, credit to non-financial corporations in blue has grown faster than credit to households here in, in green. But if we look at the number of macroprudential policies uh, targeting households, those are much more numerous in Europe than those targeting non-financial corporations. Macroprudential policies targeting non-financial corporations have been relatively uh, infrequent. And if we look at the case of Spain, which is the country in which our empirical analysis will be based, we see that even in the run-up of the previous crisis, while household credit increased substantially, credit to non-financial corporation increased even more here in red, and if we focused on credit to the real estate sector, the increase was uh, really astounding. And those large increases in, in credit will actually mirror in increases in non-performing loan, non-performing loan ratios. And while for households, non-performing loans increase substantially, going above almost 7%, the increase in non-financial corporation non-performing loans was much, much stronger, reaching 20%. And if we focus in particular on construction and real estate, it increased over 35%. And so against this, this background, the goal of this study is uh, first to, to identify the relationship between credit standards at origination and bank default risk for non-financial corporations. Our ultimate motivation is to uh, inform and calibrate the operationalization of possible borrower-based measures targeting corporate lending. And this is not a mere academic question, since recently, uh, in, in Spain in particular, we have the authority to implement limits for corporations based on indebted net measures, such as debt to assets, debt to income, the service to income, and the interest coverage ratio. But of course, the, the question really, really, comes to our, to our mind whether we really need uh, borrower-based measures targeting non-financial corporations. On the one hand, it might seem that uh, the relationship between, between, <laughs> between lending and, and systemic risk is more clear in the real estate sector. In the real estate sector, there's a clear, uh, a clear path to, for systemic risk since an increase in lending can feed, it, can feed into an increase in prices. Which in, which in turn might demand more, more lending to afford these, these higher prices. And this can lead to the typical and well-established bump bus dynamics. However, also in the, in the non-financial corporation, more in general, in, in, in the mortgage lending, uh, credit has also been associated with financial, financial crisis. And actually, the quality of this credit has also been proposed as a measure of systemic risk. And indeed, it, was, it has been found that a deterioration in credit quality to non-financial corporations is linked to uh, GDP contract, contract contractions and, and crisis. Yet, uh, already now, authorities have a number of specific capital measures targeting the corporate sector, such as sectorial systemic risk buffer or risk weight add-ons. But uh, as is in the case for household targeted borrower-based measures, we believe that borrower-based measures targeting corporations 
they do not directly at the bank level, but rather they increase the resilience of borrower. And for this reason, it can they can complement uh, capital-based, lender-based measures. But of course, a very important caveat to keep in mind is that if we were to restrict credit to more leveraged firms, that could sharply increase the risk of bankruptcies and have a potential uh, negative effect on the economy. And therefore, when we target non-financial corporations, uh, an even higher degree of caution is, is called for. Nevertheless, uh, in this work, we, we see this as a first step towards the possible personalization of corporate borrower based measures. And what we do here is we empirically analyze the link, the relation between credit standards at origination and default. Because if this exists, then there is a, a, a potential rationale to, impl to implement this type of measures. If the link we found is not so strong, then the rationale really, really the case. And uh, regarding the literature review, the, the same important literature now on the mortgage market, in which on the one hand, there have been a number of works showing that there is an important relation between loan quality and arrears and repositions. But also there are other works showing that implementing limits based on credit standards can lower excessive credit growth and house prices. And also they can lower the risk of economic constructions and financial crisis. On the non-financial corporation side, these relationships have been uh, less explored in the literature, and they oftentimes have focused on uh, large publicly traded firms and one year ahead of faults. But of course, there is an important literature looking at the determinants of, of the faults in corporates. We can cite the early work of Altman and, and, and Beaver, which again focus mostly on large, large firms, and later on other works <clears throat> included also market-based information and, and macro variables, but mostly focused on, 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 on large corporation, on issuers, and oftentimes one year ahead of faults. We could also cite another related strand of literature, which is the work of central bank collateral evaluation frameworks. But the very nature of this type of, of frameworks, they focus on, on bond issuers, since their goal is to evaluate the, the quality of the collateral they can use for the, their operations. And they also focus on short-term default, typically one year, since this is the horizon that the bank would need to sell the, the collateral in case the partner uh, had uh, default, default risk. Also, these models tend to be rather complex, and so they would be somewhat complicated to use uh, for, for, to establish policy limits. Uh, perhaps the closest work to ours is one by Antunes and collaborators, in which they look at a very uh, comprehensive sample of, of Portuguese firms, including also small, smaller firms. But they also focus on uh, one year ahead default because their motivation is, again, the central bank collateral evaluation uh, problems. But still, they find that a number of of variables linked to indebtedness, such as uh, cash flow and, and assets ratio, but also interest rate, age, and other, and other variables are, are important determinants of, of default. And in this work, what we bring in is that we will be looking at a semi-comprehensive firm sample. <clears throat> it will be, for, for firms in Spain, it will cover a whole financial cycle, which we believe is important to really uh, detect the relationship with, with, with risk. And we will focus on bank default over all the credit lifetime of the, of the loan, <clears throat> looking at standards at origination. This is important for us because if limits to credit standards were, were implemented, those should be implemented when the, the credit is, is, is granted. And we care about default, not just uh, in the short term, but also in the medium term. And so we, we believe this, it is important to consider the whole life cycle of the, the loan. So about the data, we rely importantly on the Spanish credit register. This is a very almost comprehensive uh, database of all the exposures of Spanish banks at the mostly frequency. However, it does not have uh, firm information, and for that we rely on the 
Spanish Mercantile Register. Mercantile Register has information of balance sheet and also profit and, and loss statement at the yearly level, but it's a bit less comprehensive than the uh, credit register. And we are able to, to match around half of the exposures. Here in the left hand side graph, we see that the coverage, there is a, a slight upward trend, but overall the coverage is around 50%, so it will be below 50%. And if we look at sectors, we see that the coverage for uh, large corporations is significantly better than for small business enterprises and, and real estate, but even for those, the coverage is certainly not, not negligible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have uh, a problem in our database, and is that before 2016, the credit register does not identify individual individual loans, but instead it identifies outstanding credit from a bank to a firm. And so we need first to identify new new credits, and for that we basically look at new bank firm relations in our database, so relations that were not present the previous month, and also we look at monthly increases in outstanding that are over 10% of the bank firm exposure, because this would correspond to a significant increase in the amount granted. And if there was a, a limit uh, implemented, it would, it would apply, so it's also important for us. In this way, we identify the new loans and then we follow them forward in time on the credit register and we note whether eventually at any point the loan enters into default. In this way, we obtain a cross-section of new loans with firm characteristics and an indicator of whether the fault ever, ever occurred. And since the coverage of our balance sheet data is, is a bit limited, here we explore whether it gives us a representative sample. And on the first graph, we just show the uh, distribution of credit sizes, of new credit sizes that we identified between the whole sample in red and the sample with credit with balance sheet information in, in green. And we see that they look very, very similar. So there are no important differences. But if we look at the percentage of loans that ever enter into the fault, we see that there are important differences. And indeed, in the sample with balance sheet information, the defaults are somewhat smaller. If we wait by, by credit size, then the differences are smaller, but still they are, they are there. And this, of course, raises the possibility of a selection bias. It might be that our sample with balance sheet information includes only the best firms, and so the, the relationship that we identify might not be representative, and this is an issue that we will analyze later in, in more detail. And uh, let me show you here uh, the relationship, the association between the fraction of loans that ever enter into default and the quint quintiles of the different standards. So for example, here for the real estate and construction sector, in blue, uh, I show you the fraction of loans that ever into, enter into default for uh, those in the first quantile in the bottom 20% of the debt to assets ratio. That would be the first point, and the last point would correspond to those in the top 20%, so the top quantile of the debt to assets ratio. And what we can see is that there is a very large increase in the proportion of the faults going from around 6% to over 30%. So this is an increase of more than a, fact, of a factor of five. So it's a really, really large association. If we look at other standards, such as the debt service to income or the debt to income, the relationship is similar, although it seems to be somewhat monotonic at the, at the top. If we look at interest coverage ratio, the slope is the opposite, but this is expected since for interest coverage ratio, larger numbers correspond to lower indebtedness. So again, there's a clear association of, in this case, low indebtedness, lower defaults, high indebtedness, higher defaults. The situation is very similar for small and mid-sized enterprises and also for large companies. In the case of large companies, if we look at the, the scale, the dependence is a bit smaller, it's a bit weaker, but still, we move from around 3% to over 10%. So again, there's a factor of three difference in, in defaults, depending on the quantile of, in this case, the debt to assets. So we 
Here we see a very, very strong association between credit standards at origination of future defaults. But of course, this is just uh, association without having any control, and we want to be a bit more systematic than that. And for that, our base, the baseline model that we use is a linear probability model in which we regress an indicator variable for whether the loan ever enters into default over the lending standard at origination and a number of permanent loan characteristics as well as fixed effects. For loan characteristics, we include things like age, size, liquidity, profitability, and collateral. For the interest rate, we don't have the information of the interest rate of each, of each loan, which we would like to include, but we don't have it. Instead, we rely on a, on a proxy, a firm level proxy, which we build as the ratio of interest expenses of the firm over the total debt of the firm over all banks and, 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 and non-banks. And maybe I should indicate that uh, our baseline variable for, for, for default is basically being in arrears for at least uh, 90 days. <clears throat> so here we can see some of the main results, in this case for small and mid-sized enterprises and considering the debt to assets ratio. The first column is the regression without any control, and in, in the other columns we include different controls as well as fixed effects. And what we can see is that there is a very substantial association between, in this case, debt to assets and defaults. The coefficient is always very significant and is very robust to the different controls and is very substantial. We should note that the average default is around 10%. So here, an increase of debt to assets from, from zero to, to one would, would lead to a pretty much a doubling in, in, in the fraction of defaults. This is for, for SMEs. If we look at real estate sector, we find something pretty similar. Again, the association is clear and is robust to uh, the different controls. Slightly smaller than before, but still quite substantial. And if we look at uh, large companies, again, we find very, very substantial and robust increase, which is always very uh, statistically significant. This is for debt to assets. If we look at other standards, income base, such as the debt to income, debt service to income, interest coverage ratio, which is something similar. Here for the most complete model with full controls and fixed effects, we always find a very substantial and, and robust coefficient, except the case for, of, of debt to income for large companies, in, where the association is not significant, but for other sectors and, and standards, the association is there and is, and is large and with the expected, expected sign. So I have argued that this association is very robust, but we have identified a number of variables which uh, significantly affect the association between the standard and, and the faults. And in particular, we have found that the age of the firm and whether the bank firm relationship is a new one, it affects substantially decreases the association. So here, uh, column one is just the, the baseline as before. In column two, we restrict the sample to only firms younger than five years. And in column three, we restrict the sample to only new bank firm relations. And in both cases, the coefficient is significantly lower. It decreases between 30 and 50 or 50%. And with the whole sample, but interacting in this case, the two assets with the indicators for this type of firms, we also find negative and very substantial coefficients. And this holds for the three sectors that we have analyzed and also for other standards. Here I showed you for the two assets, but the situation is very similar for the service to income, interest coverage ratio, and the two income. These can have potentially important policy, policy implications, since, for example, Young firms, on the one hand, might be more depending on, on bank credit in order to grow, and also the, the prospects might be, or the, 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 their debt repaying capacity might be more linked to the prospects and to the current uh, balance sheet. And here, what we find is that, from a purely statistical point of view, it's also the case that for for young firms, the relationship is less less strong, and therefore there is a, a case to uh, make. Uh, less stringent limits to these type of young firms. 
Uh, the model so far was linear, but we can, of course, include nonlinear coefficients on the different lending standards, and they tend to be significant and uh, lead to somewhat concave relations. But this is better appreciated in the graphically. Here, uh, those are the predictive margins, which basically are the predictive probability of the fault according to the model. And we see how this changes when we change the value of the to two assets, here the two income, here the interest coverage ratio. And this is the model with nonlinear terms. And what we see is that the, li the, the lines are almost straight lines. If they were straight, there would be no nonlinear effects. So here we see that the, for the two assets and the two income, the nonlinear effects are very, very limited. But for the interest coverage ratio, we do see important linearities. And this might suggest uh, a limit, a possible limit for the interest coverage ratio, since for large interest coverage ratio, we see no effect, but for lower, up, starting for some, some limit, we start to see a large increase in, in the fall probability. And uh, we have performed a number of, of robustness exercises. Perhaps most important is to check the how whether our sample is representative or there is the presence of, of any bias. Since, as I described before, our sample is only, only covers around half of the exposures of Spanish banks. And uh, here we use a Heckman selection model to study whether there is there is evidence of, of selection in our sample. And what we find is that the Heckman model uh, returns results that are almost identical <clears throat> to those of our baseline model. And this is the case for the different uh, standards and also for the different uh, sectors. The, the, the results are always very, very close. So we conclude that there is, there's no evidence of selection bias and therefore our sample can be considered representative of the whole universe of Spanish firms. We have also explored including together several credit standards at the same time in the model. And we find that if we include debt to assets and also together debt to income, the uh, gain in the model is very limited. But if we include debt to assets and together with interest coverage ratio, the gain can be substantial. So here the different lines correspond to different values of the interest coverage ratio. And we see that for the same debt to assets ratio, having a larger uh, interest coverage ratio is linked to, to, to lower, clearly lower uh, default prediction. And uh, our baseline model was, was linear probability, but of course we, che we checked with a logit and probit model and we obtained, here I compare the linear probability with the logit and probit models and the results are almost on top of each other except perhaps for the interest coverage ratio where the linearities are, are more important, but overall the results are very, very robust to the model. And we also include, uh, we explore weaker and stronger notions of default, including whether the firm really, whether the bank really writes up the credit or whether we, we, we use a subjective uh, a statement from the bank indicating that the credit is, is dubious and the results are very, very similar. We compare analyzing bank and non-bank debt separately, and we find that they both have strong associations, but the association of bank debt is, is stronger. And uh, if we look at different subsamples, we also find uh, association in, in every case, although it's somewhat weaker post-2011. And with this, I, I reach my conclusions. <clears throat> We have found a very strong and robust relation between credit standards, at origination, and bank default frequency. It's stronger for debt to assets and interest coverage ratio, and especially for SMEs and real estate firms, but also for the other sectors. The relationship found is weaker for young firms and new bank firm relations. Considering various standards simultaneously adds discriminatory power, and so there is some scope for complementarities of, of, of using different, potentially different measures at the same time. And uh, we hope this is a first step towards the calibration of macroprudential borrower-based measures targeting in non-financial corporations. This is promising, showing that there is an important association, but of course, uh, care must be taken and we need to, to be mindful of the possible negative effects. And with this, I, I, I welcome your your comments and questions.
Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. So, as yeah. So now the other Marco will do the second discussion. Okay. Good evening. Um, thank you for the invitation, and it has been a pleasure actually to read this paper. It's very clear, and. Uh, a few more minutes of energy before concluding. <laughs> I will try to not take too much time. So um, let me briefly uh, summarize again the key points of the study, but very briefly. So they find uh, um, a link between uh, uh, lending standards at originations and uh, default risk on corporate loans. Uh, this link is different uh, depending on uh, the business type of the firms, uh, and it's very robust across, um, uh, across different tests that they do. Um, and they rely on a very nice data set, it's uh, micro data uh, for like, the exposures, uh, they use the credit registry uh, and then they match essentially with the firm balance sheet data again uh, from uh, Bank of Spain. Mm -hmm. So this paper um, contributes to the discussion uh, on uh, borrower-based measure for the corporate sectors by showing obviously the importance of lending standards at origination that of course could be a variable that uh, policymakers can control. And also because uh, it offers some insights on the possible calibrations of the borrower-based measures, especially on uh, uh, the role of firm heterogeneity in setting borrower-based measures. So um, I have a few comments, uh, a few technical comments, and then some general points uh, for a broader discussion on borrower-based measures. Um, let me start with the technical comments. Um, you see, um, or you saw already the equation that is the econometrics, uh, the linear probability model. Uh, there is the default indicator when a company default on a, an exposure to, to a bank, uh, and this is explained by the lending standards, controls for firm and, expo that are firm and exposure specific, uh, and then the, the fixed effects by bank, sector, location, uh, and time. Now, I must say that here the devil is really in the details because there, are, there is a lot of things that you need to do to construct these variables, and the paper is really clear. But for example, um, they can approximately identify new loans, as we've been see, uh, as we saw from the, the presentation. But then um, they cannot identify on which loan the default occurs. So they assume the default on the wall exposure. So the paper is very clear about this. Uh, they do robustness, uh, and of course, uh, um, there are pros and cons. But let me go to my suggestions. Uh, the first one, uh, maybe the authors will not agree, but uh, um, I'm convinced that there must be some non-linearity in this data. I really expect that the relationship between uh, credit uh, uh, standards and default is non-linear. Of course, they explore some non-linearity, especially um, a quadratic form. But I will try to use the buckets that they also use at the beginning in the regressions or explore uh, models with threshold effects. Uh, why? Because the discussion of thresholds is very important for the calibration of borrower-based measures. And uh, uh, I, I think that I would like to see a bit more on that to be convinced that there's really not much non-linearity in, in the data. And I think some non-linearity is there, maybe not for all the categories that I analyzed, but for some, I think for some categories of further, you can see that there is something. The second point on non-linearity is the interactions among, uh, among credit standards. So uh, what if two credit standards are high risk? Does it amplify the effect on, on the default risk? There is something there, but I think even there, there could be more. And again, the interaction with the buckets could be interesting. Uh, another point, okay, it was not in the presentations, but essentially all the controls are uh, lagged. Um, this is to use information that is available in real time, but I don't think it's strictly needed in this type of paper. Uh, we are not uh, in this paper. They are not assessing, you know, whether uh, uh, variables that are available in real time have forecasting power, but they are after the true link between credit standards and default risk. So, if possible and if available, I, use, I will use contemporaneous variables. Uh, one point on the time horizon that I have. So, the horizon of default is essentially indefinite. No, they look at whether a loan has ever defaulted which is good, but there is one detail that I didn't find in the paper, and I would like to know whether 
the loans that are currently performing are excluded from the analysis because, of course, this brings a, a bias. You don't know what will be the future of this loan. They can default in the future. And again, also to maybe solve this uh, issue, maybe they can um, run some robustness on specific time horizons. So, of course, focusing on the long term and focusing on the credit card origination, but setting a time horizon of five years on 10 years and see whether the results hold. And one last point as a suggestion, um, I will focus as a baseline on the joint estimation on the model of the joint, with the joint estimation of the lending standards. This is because in this way you can assess the joint significance and I think that there are no constraints in the sample. There are hundreds of thousands of observations, so you can, you can do that. So maybe these are some suggestions. Maybe here are one chart to make the point that non-linearity is important and also the interactions, especially in mortgage markets. Uh, this is what we find for uh, um, the LTI. So we, saw, we see the default uh, rates for uh, uh, mortgage loans uh, by quintile of the LTI in blue. And then you see that if you condition this to a high LTV too, then, uh, and we have the yellow bar, then the default become higher. And the effect is concentrated in the uh, top, uh, on, in the fifth quantile essentially. So there is a interaction and no linearity. And this especially we see it for the mortgage loans. Um, a couple of ideas that I had when reading the papers, this is not really for, for this paper, but um, for, for an expansion, of course, uh, um, uh, in the results that are well explained and every coefficient is really explained why it has this sign and not the other sign, there is a robust result on the role of liquidity in uh, lowering the fold risk. And of course, this can open up the issue of whether we want also some sort of liquidity standards, at least for certain type of firms. And finally, I think there is a lot in the fixed effects of these models. Um, for example, the bank fixed effects tells you whether a specific bank um, underestimates systematically the risk of default. And then, of course, you can link it to best bank specific features. I think this is quite interesting and I didn't see it explored uh, also in, in other papers. So, and then, of course, you can even interact with time to see how this bias evolve over the cycle. So a few ideas. Now, let me come to my comments on, in general, on the borrower-based measures. Um, I would say that borrower-based measures for mortgage, mortgage loans are already a bit of an headache for policymakers. Forget about, uh, uh, you know, the political implications. But of course, uh, it seems an easy, easy setting. You just have two players, the lender, which is the bank, and the borrower, that is, that is normally the household. There is a relatively simple inform, for enforcement. The banks and the supervisors take care. But we have country specificities. There is multiple choices of instruments. There are different business types. Think about first-time buyers uh, versus the buy-to-let. And these essentially uh, result uh, in already heterogeneous approaches to the setting of borrower-based measures. And here we have an example uh, on, of the dispersion in the euro area. This focuses just on uh, policies for uh, first-time buyers. And we see the LTV ranges from 80% um, to 100%. And we know today who is the 100%. Um, so, and then the DSDI ranges from 30% to 80%. Here, um, there is a little detail, which is the definition of income, of course, that matters a lot. And then also the exemptions uh, varies a lot across countries. The exemptions is the fraction of loans that can deviate from the central limit. And you see for the LTV, they deviate from 10% of, 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 uh, of the total loans to 35%. So even in this simple setting, there is a lot of uh, margin <laughs> for <laughs> changing the calibration. So the key question then is how will the borrower-based measures for corporate look like? So here we have several players. The lenders are banks and markets. The borrowers are firms with different business types. And of course, the message is uh, the calibration, one calibration cannot fit all. Uh, we already saw from the results of the paper that uh, small, medium enterprises, uh, young firms, uh, large corporations, they uh, probably need the different calibrations. And probably there is in general a, low, a role from the dependence on external finance in setting these measures. Uh, but then the question is really, how do you design them? Do you set different limits across business? Do you set a central limits and then 
you set exemptions uh, for different business, or you just focus uh, to simplify on a systemic sector, for example, the real estate. And then, of course, uh, there is uh, uh, the issue that enforcement is challenging um, because firms can get uh, uh, funds from banks uh, and markets, and I'm sure there, are, there could be leakages, and you know, they will find their way through. And I think we have already some evidence of leakages. We worked hard on that, and here it is. I think it's uncontroversial. <laughs> and I think that's it for me. Thanks a lot for, um, for the attention. Thank you, Marco. Very, very impressive discussion. So well, I think as we have time for dinner for a couple of questions, uh, and then we give the floor back to, yeah. So let's start here and then Erlen. Uh, thank you very much on a very interesting presentation that such as an important aspect. And uh, I think what the authors find that credit under underwriting standards are really important for uh, default, that is no doubt. And um, I was wondering if authors have really thought about using forward looking information on a given enterprise or a project, because most of the banks, I think, when they evaluate uh, company credit worthiness, they are looking not only at backward looking information like debt to asset ratios and whatnot, but also uh, forward looking uh, information on a particular project, whether it would uh, generate uh, sufficient capacity in terms of um, in terms of uh, money flow. Uh, another thing I didn't really catch it, uh, perhaps the author could clarify whether they are using a, a loan default model versus firm default or company default model, because in many cases, companies do have many loans in different uh, banking institutions. And uh, for example, they may have like trucking leases for a hundred tr trucks and, and, and whatnot. So there is a bit of a correlated uh, correlation across these defaults when you consider uh, a single uh, company. So yeah, at least uh, in my experience, we did similar models, and to address that, we did firm defaults. Um, and another thing that's important, also not also for the estimations, but also for implementation of potential macroprudential policy, is whether uh, these financial ratios and financial statistics are based on a company level or group level uh, consolidated, because many times you may get a subsidiary company which is uh, backed uh, by a mother company operating within a group, they're uh, within firm, across firm, uh, different relationships, and uh, sometimes you have a guarantor, uh, a person, a personal guarantor, like a household or a, or a guarantor in terms of uh, another company. So that's also one thing we have to have in mind when both estimating and implementing macro pro. And I, I'm not sure if you've used, but many authors also use the number of relationship with banks and the length if, in terms of time of a relationship with a specific bank because it may also be a kind of a good predictor of whether a firm could default thank you okay um my question goes to the uh, heterogeneity across uh, sectors uh, i understand that this is one of the a standard reasons why it may be quite difficult to implement borrow-based tools uh, for the corporate sector that, uh, you know, corporate finance tells you that, uh, and I think Marco alluded to that, that different types of businesses may have different debt uh, carrying capacity. Um, and I, I think actually um, you could look at this uh, in the context of your paper, because I think that sits in your fixed effects. You have fixed effects for subsectors and uh, you could examine uh, whether these fixed effects are significantly different. Uh, you could look at the distribution of these fixed effects and see whether there's a whole range, uh, broad, you know, how, how they distrib distribute to see whether there, there is in indeed this heterogeneity that uh, could make our lives uh, more difficult. Thank you. Uh, two questions here, and then we close those. Oh, okay. Oh, no, sorry. Let's not, um, not overlap, okay. Uh, let's start here, then we come back here. Okay, we have two questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, paper. 
And uh, I'm wondering if it's not a question, but a suggestion more. Uh, if uh, using this very rich database that is very mm, gives you the possibility of, of uh, deepening in the analysis of the differences between the companies, uh, could we, um, you, you for example, uh, separate uh, SMEs from uh, other uh, large large companies, but maybe could be analyzed uh, other characteristics that could explain the behavior of the company compared to the average of, of, of the sector. Uh, I mean, uh, doing uh, using uh, classific standard classifications of uh, sectors of activity uh, and using uh, ratios from the balance sheet compared to the average of that ratio of the sector. And then uh, looking at if, if uh, some uh, these differences of the, of the ratios compared to the average uh, have uh, relevance are uh, relevant in the in the in the mortgage uh, not mortgage sorry in the credit uh, uh, in, in the defaults or uh, the credit worthiness of these companies how they how they behave it's kind of different different well, is probably what you mean no? one question there Um, I really like the research question. I just wonder, so you say that lending standard have an effect on default. This is no doubt about that. But I think one missing link there is that I wonder if you could explore in your data the link between macro prudential policies that leading to those changes in lending standards, right? So maybe bank chain lending standards because of their just their own risk appetite changing, but it could also be that during the time period you observe changes in CCYB policies or LTV policies. And then if you could link that to the changes in the lending standard in your model, then maybe the link between macro potential policy leading to the change in default would be, I guess, more clear. So it's just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we'll be cut and then we come back here. Maybe let's proceed here for a reason of practicality. Thanks a lot. Katarzyna Wodnik, European Central Bank. So two questions, uh, as I, um, some of the questions I had were anticipated already. So two are left. Uh, one is very much along what Mark already said. I was wondering, watching your presentation, why didn't you go for something like a survival analysis. And I tell you like uh, why I'm bothered. Because the way I understand your analysis, it's like you pull together loans, which are working capital loans and investment loans. And the policy message we give is that you impose more or less the same borrow-based measure uh, on both, irrespectively of how long they are supposed to work. And whereas I would say that uh, when a bank gives uh, a loan for one year, it should take a bit much less of a risk than for five years. And I would gladly distinguish it. And survival analysis could probably work with your data to a degree. I understand it using more without losing many observations. And the other thing is like a more conceptual. So I agree about everything uh, said about sectors, but there's something broader than that. So when we talk about households and uh, that they should have some borrower based measures goes without saying. When I think of firms and I think about debt to assets, what I remember from accounting classes is that the higher debt, uh, the lower taxes. And uh, this means that to a degree, uh, corporates, in contrast to households, benefit from leverage. And that is why I would expect that nonlinearities, which we observe for households, will be different than nonlinearities we expect for corporates, or maybe the relationship will appear in different parts of the distribution. Some discussion of it, some exploration, not copy pasting from households to corporates would be really evaluated because what you touched upon is, uh, is really inspiring. So super work. Thanks a lot. Okay, and last but not least, 
50%. Hello, Klaus Speckman from Aarhus University and SAFE. I, I guess I just wanted to echo the point that you got that don't just throw everything into the fixed effect, but rather try to explore them a little bit more. And what I was thinking was to explore the time dimension, maybe, you know, interacted with the credit standards to see if there's something over time. But as a general point, you know, sector and time heterogeneity is important for, for macro financial policy. So just don't put them all in the fixed effect. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Luis, I know it's a cliche, but uh, you really literally stand between us and uh, the finest German cuisine. Uh, so, no, the, the jokes apart, I mean, if you can be concise, please. But uh, you, you got a lot of comments, but uh, perhaps you can wrap up, uh, you know, the most important ones. Thank you. Yes, I'll do my best. Uh, first, th thank you all. Thank you, Marco, and thank you all the, all the commenters. They are very, very good points. And uh, just a few, a few, a few points. Uh, on the, on the heterogeneity part and the nonlinearity, we do see some nonlinear effects, mostly between the two assets and interest coverage ratio and mostly for large corporations. But for others, we saw we see less than that. I, I, I take your point. We can explore this in more detail. We can expand looking at looking at thresholds and, and, and doing this even uh, in different ways, perhaps uh, non-parametrically. But yeah, this is a good point. On the fixed effect, as several of you, of you commented, uh, we do have sector fixed effects at the two-digit two, two NACI code. And uh, we haven't looked really, uh, you are right, we haven't looked at uh, how average default varies across sectors. And this is something we can, we can explore perhaps. Most importantly for us would be whether uh, those sectors respond differently to 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 the, the two assets or to the different the, the different uh, standards. We see that across the broad three sectors we consider there are important differences, and perhaps this is certainly worth exploring. Whether we see an even more uh, fine grain um, difference. Uh, so in in so in the model we we do include. Uh, we do include also performing loans. So we include those that perform and those that don't. We, we, we include all of them. We do exclude those that at origination are already with some level of default to avoid having uh, zombie, zombie lending. Although this has a small effect because there are very few of these type of, of credits. And we do, we do explore the, the, the effect over time of the standards. And we find that the effect is higher during crisis times. So apparently during crisis times, it's really when these measures are more informative. And we find that in, in more recent times, the, the effect is slightly smaller, but still is, is still is there and still is pretty, pretty significant. Uh, we can look at the effect of, of different macroprudential policies in Spain. And so far, there would be mostly capital, capital, capital buffers, which might have affected some banks or perhaps they have uh, strengthened. They have limited uh, some of the uh, of the standards, and we can see the, the effect of this, as uh, some of you suggested. Uh, the rapid analysis is something we we, we have considered. Uh, we we do sometimes we have explored uh, looking only at uh, default in three year or five year horizons, and the results are pretty pretty similar. But we can do this more systemic, systemic systematically with with a duration model, survival model, as as you suggest. And uh, about groups, we 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 look at individual individual firm level, but we include a, a dummy for whether the firm is part of a group, and we find that this dummy is important, especially for smaller firms. So firms that are part of a bigger group default less, and this is not too surprising. For larger firms, it has much less 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 importance, and we did find that the the effect of the two assets is it's or, or the other standards is not affected by whether the firm is part of a group. And uh, well, I think I will leave it here. Just thank you again for all the all the suggestions and comments. They are, they are very well taken. Thank you. Let's let us finish with a round of applause for the session. <laughs>